Good evening, wherever you may be. My name is Jeff Lejeune. I'm a food safety officer here at FAO in the Division of Food Systems and Food Safety. And on behalf of the FAO uh, AMR Working Group, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. We have the uh, fortunate opportunity today to hear from Dr. Lawrence Goodrich, who I'll introduce in a moment, uh, talking about antifungal resistance, what's all the hype about. So uh, I have a few uh, introductory comments I'd just like to go through. Uh, and we'll start at all of you. Uh, thank you already for keeping your microphones on mute. Uh, so not to disturb the others as we go through. If you could, it would be helpful to rename yourself on Zoom uh, with your organization and your name. So when we refer to you, if you're asking questions, we can get back to you specifically. Uh, I'll uh, caveat here the views presented today are those of Dr. Lawrence Goodridge and not those necessarily uh, in terms of the uh, chat. We have the chat there is available to post questions and we will aim to answer those questions as we go through. Just keep in mind that we'd ask you to refrain from posting any kind of advertisements or commercial services uh, in or branding in that um, a chat box there. Uh, the last thing I'll mention that this meeting is being recorded, which we will be able to share after uh, the meeting. I would ask you if you do not agree to be recorded, either to not say anything uh, or just leave the meeting and then you will not be recorded. The same goes for the chat discussion. The chat discussion will be recorded and shared at a later time. So, um, this is for, we can mention this at the end, we will, this is a monthly uh, webinar series, we will have another seminar next month on the 8th of September, and being enrolled in this uh, listserv, we can inform you of the topic and the speaker. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, introduce the speaker. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Goodrich is a Leung Family Professor of Food Safety and the director of the Canadian Research Institute for Food Safety at the University of Guelph, located in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. Uh, his primary research is in the development of approaches for risk assessments for foodborne microorganisms, uh, achieving this goal by combining both phenotypic and genotypic uh, analysis and methods to characterize both virulence and antimicrobial resistance in foodborne microorganisms. Um, the specific research studies uh, support, um, I'm just trying to figure out how to quit sharing my screen here. Um, here we go, sorry. His, his specific research areas are uh, identifying mechanisms of resistance in bacteria and in fungi and the role of mobile genetic elements. Uh, he also identifies new antimicrobial compounds that may be used to control the growth of pathogenic bacteria. And I know uh, in the last two years, as many people have uh, leveraged this knowledge in, in, in terms of addressing the COVID pandemic. With no further ado, I think I'll pass it over to Dr. Goodrich uh, to begin. The format here is a, about a 30 minute presentation, followed by adequate times for uh, question and answer. Larry, please, welcome. Great. Uh, thank you, Jeff. And I will just um, share my screen here. Can you see my screen? Looks great. Please proceed. Great, thank you. So, um, good good afternoon, everyone, um, or um, good morning or good evening, uh, depending on on where you're joining us. Um, and uh, I'd like to uh, to thank thank you, uh, Jeff and uh, and FAO, for inviting me to uh, to share my my research this uh, today, where we'll be talking about antifungal resistance. Um, 
Okay. So to begin, uh, we know that antimicrobial resistance uh, is an emerging threat to global public health. Uh, currently, there are approximately 700,000 deaths caused by AMR uh, every year. And it's estimated that by 2050, there'll be 10 million deaths caused, uh, which will exceed uh, the deaths caused by various other um, illnesses uh, or reasons for death, as you can see on the right side of the screen, including cancer. So we really need to uh, begin to study AMR um, with the goal of trying to understand the mechanisms by which uh, resistance is developed, and also with the goal of trying to develop alternative approaches uh, for the treatment of pathogenic microorganisms. So one aspect of AMR is antifungal resistance, which has not received the same attention that antibiotic, or I mean, um, antibacterial resistance has has received. And so today we will focus on antifungal resistance. And so this is uh, related to the use of fungicides um, or fungistats that would either kill or inhibit the growth of pathogenic fun fungi uh, and pathogenic meaning pathogenic to humans. And the, the issue here is that there's only three types of, uh, of antifungal drugs. Um, and so uh, because of that, um, unlike antibiotics that are used to treat bacteria, uh, we really are, are limited to how we can treat these pathogens. And the concern is that bloodstream infections that, uh, that can develop in humans, if they are resistant to these, uh, if they should become resistant to these uh, three types of antifungal drugs, um, that can lead to serious health outcomes and even death. And um, there are several, um, well, there are actually many different uh, fungi that are resistant to antifungal drugs, but the two main genera of fungi that are of, of primary concern are aspergillus and, uh, and candida. And, and within candida, candida auris, which is a, a new species um, that is particularly resistant to antifungal drugs um, and can spread in healthcare settings is, is, of, is of major concern. So <clears throat> when we talk about uh, fungicides or also different types of fungicides, but really it's the azole compounds that are of concern here. Uh, and they've been used in, in agricultural practices since the mid 1960s to control the growth of fungi on food crops uh, and to, to stop spoilage. Um, and you can see on, on the slide that the, the crops that, uh, that azole compounds have, have been used on and, and are currently used. So the situation with, with the azole compounds are somewhat analogous to, if we think of bacteria, the use of uh, antibiotics um, in, in food production, in, the, in that case, uh, use in food animals. Uh, and we've certainly seen the rise of, uh, of antimicrobial resistance, the rapid rise of antimicrobial resistance, um, and not just antimicrobial resistance, but resistance to multiple um, drugs in, in bacteria because of the use in agriculture. And that has led to now um, global approaches to try to reduce the use of those compounds. And, and so it's, it, it's the same with fungi uh, because um, of the use of uh, fungicides um, in, in, in food production, there is concern that this is driving uh, the, the emergence and rapid emergence of antifungal resistance. So, this slide here um, just shows uh, the mechanisms by which um, resistance can develop uh, to azoles in fungi. And so um, I, I should also point out that the concern here um, 
again, like the use of antibiotics in bacteria is, is the fact that um, once resistance develops to compounds uh, used as fungicides um, or fungistats in agriculture, um, this could also lead to resistance to uh, azole or uh, to compounds to uh, antifungals used in health, in human health, and even veterinary medicine. So um, if we look at, uh, at if we start here, um, at section A, um, we can, we see that this is showing the use of fungicides in agriculture. And as I've said, this uh, may, develop, may lead to development of resistance um, in fungi, uh, primarily through the development of mutations um, that allow the, uh, the fungi to uh, essentially inhibit the, uh, the compound, the azole compound. And, and we'll talk about that in a little bit more. Um, then if we go down to, to section B here, um, we see humans are exposed um, to the um, either resistant or sensitive um, spores of, in this case, Aspergillus fumigatus, which is, is one of the main species of concern, um, and, and they become ill. And then um, <clears throat> if, uh, if um, the patients are then treated in, in, in section C with the uh, az medical triazole compounds, um, then um, this further leads to resistance uh, or selection of resistant strains. <clears throat> Patients can also become um, infected by inhaling sensitive aspergillus spores. Um, and then if they, so, the, so in, in certain people, these spores can cause an opportunistic infection. And so if they receive long-term azole therapy, then um, this could drive resistance. And that is uh, section E here. So they've um, inhaled it and, and some of the, the, uh, the um, patients will develop a resistant infection due to long-term exposure uh, of the, uh, of the, um, the uh, fungi to the medical triazole compounds, um, or in E, the patient could recover. So we're really worried here about, about section F, and this is the whole basis uh, for this work. So the, our objective in, in, uh, in this project was to determine the, the prevalence of azole resistant aspergillus in food crops and their environments, uh, and then also to characterize the resistant isolates to identify resistance mechanisms. Uh, and, and really uh, the focus here is on the potential um, environmental and clinical resistance linkage. So by, what I, by that, what I mean is uh, it's, you know, the, the, um, the role that agriculture plays in um, leading to development of, of fungal resistance to triazole compounds, um, I would say remains unproven. And by that, what I mean is, while there's been a, a lot of studies showing a potential linkage, um, there really hasn't been a definit definitive concrete uh, proof, at least that, that the entire scientific community agrees with. And so one way to, to try to develop that proof is to look for resistance mechanisms that appear to be specific uh, or develop specifically in agricultural isolates of, uh, of aspergillus that are resistant. And then to see if those same resistance mechanisms can then be found in clinical isolates of the fungi. And so uh, that was one aspect of our study here. So, <clears throat> Um, we, we looked at several food crops, including tomatoes, wheat, and barley, uh, and, and we sampled them to collect the uh, fungal isolates. 
um, these foods were, were uh, produced in North America, in various countries in North America. Um, and so we purchased the uh, tomatoes from grocery stores or other retail settings. And, uh, and, and the barley and wheat came directly from farmers. And we sampled a number of, um, of aliquots uh, to isolate uh, fungi. And um, up, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, because there's a diversity of resistance mechanisms and so forth, we, we collected a large number of, of isolates um, per plate from per food crop uh, and, uh, and we did our, our work that way. So this just shows uh, the methods. Um, once we had collected the isolates, uh, this just shows two approaches that we used to determine susceptibility to azo um, compounds. And so we um, used an azo compound called Defenoconazole, which is a, a, a broad spectrum um, azo compound used in as a as a fungicide in agriculture, and so in the on the panel on the left, we added that to uh, an agar called potato dextrose agar, which is is typically used to grow fungi, um, and then we uh, we mix that and put that into a petri plate, and once it solidified. <clears throat> Then we added, uh, we we actually inoculate or we streaked uh, independent individual uh, fungal isolates that we'd isolated from the tomato, wheat, and barley onto the uh, petri plate. So we used 30 micrograms <clears throat> per mil of the the phenylconazole compound on the plate uh, because that's uh, really, according to scientific literature, uh, what delineates resistance, full resistance from, uh, from sensitivity. And then um, in the second uh, uh, approach on the right, <clears throat> we used a microplate assay. So we took <clears throat> the uh, fungal isolates at the top and we <clears throat> inoculated them into broth. Um, and then we uh, had broth with the, the phenylconazole compound and we added that to the uh, microtire plate. And then <clears throat> once the uh, fungal isolates had independently grown in, in their uh, individual broth tubes, we then added that to the microplate as well. Again, the cutoff was uh, 30 micrograms per mil that we use. And so here we, um, we incubated the, uh, the plates for, 20, for up to 48 hours at 37 degrees Celsius, and we looked for um, growth, which was determined by optical density. And each uh, microplate uh, had a control uh, strain, or two control strains, one that was uh, sensitive to the compound and one that was resistant. And so resistance was, was determined by OD as well as comparing to the control. So, um, before we, we go further, um, it's in order for you to understand some of the results that I will show today, it's important to understand the mechanisms of resistance to azole drugs that are currently, um, the, the current mechanisms that are understood to cause resistance to azole drugs. So there's three major uh, mechanisms. Um, in, um, in panel A here, um, uh, and and, and two of them really, uh, I should say, um, are based around the CYP51A gene. And so in panel A, um, this is showing the presence of mutations um, that um, are responsible for a substitution effect, um, which, is, which is based on causing structural modifications of the CYP51A enzyme. And so what this does, it leads to uh, reduced azole affinity intake. Um, and so uh, there are several amino acid changes that have been reported in the literature. And so these designations here, G54, P216, et cetera, um, are, have been identified and associated with that. In panel B, 
we have overexpression of the CYP51A gene uh, due to uh, uh, various um, insertions in its promoter region. So um, here you see the designation TR34, for example. Um, there, there, ha there are other uh, insertions that have been recognized, uh, TR46, uh, TR53, for example. Um, and, and these insertions in the promoter region um, are combined with a substitution at codon 98 of the, uh, of the um, gene, uh, which leads to a substitution of leucine to histidine. Uh, so leucine to histidine, hence the designation L98H. So this combination um, leads to overexpression of the um, C1, CYP51A gene, uh, which also, again, leads to um, reduced or complete um, elimination of azole uptake. And then um, finally, uh, <clears throat> panel C, which is a uh, um, overexpression of uh, efflux transporter. So this is basically a, a pump that um, pumps out toxic compounds out of the cell, much like um, in bacteria, we see efflux transporters playing a major role in antibiotic resistance. And so this basically just pumps out the, the toxic compound, in this case, the azole compound out of the cell. Um, so um, A, uh, section A and section B are the main um, roots of, of uh, resistance that have received the most attention in the literature. And so we really focused our attention on, on, on these two uh, mechanisms of resistance in our work. So this uh, slide shows that those two mechanisms uh, in a bit more detail. Um, so here we see in, in, in some more detail, the CYP51A gene and its promoter um, showing the locations of the modification. So, um, in panel A, this is the wild type strain, um, a wild type strain, which is sensitive to azole compounds. And so you can see in the promoter region, um, we don't have a, a tandem repeat or a, a, a inclusion of additional amino acids. And you see the L98 um, amino acid um, downstream of the promoter. In panel B, which is a uh, azole resistance strain, we see this TR, the tandem repeat, um, which could be 34 amino acids long, 46 amino acids long, or 53. And we also see this substitution um, <clears throat> of the leucine to, um, to, um, <clears throat> to a histidine. Um, and, and it's both of these compounds, or both of these uh, changes that lead to the um, uh, overexpression of the CYP51A gene and resistance. So <clears throat> the first thing we did um, was, well, we want to, to look at uh, these resistance mechanisms and try to understand um, which, what were the most common ones uh, so that we could then look for that in our isolates. So we took genome sequences of triazole resistant strains of Aspergillus fumigatus from the NCBI database. Um, and we identified the six most common uh, mutations of the CYP51A gene. So we've already talked about the tandem repeats, uh, the L98H mutation, and we looked at two other mutations, um, M220 mutation and G54. So those la latter two are the, uh, uh, would be in, um, in the panel A of the diagram I showed you, the, the amino acid substitutions. Um, and then we identified sequences, the sequences as either environmental. Uh, so what I mean by that is we identified um, in, in the genomes that had these mutations, we identified those genomes as coming from environmental isolates of uh, Aspergillus fumigatus clinical isolates of Aspergillus fumigatus or paired clinical or environmental isolates. Uh, and, and this identification came from their original publications. 
So in other words, what were their, their sources, what were the sources of the ISIS with the mutations? And again, this was done in an attempt to see whether we could identify um, any specific uh, mutations that seem to be only associated with environmental isolates, uh, and then to, to, to check for those in, in clinical isolates as a way to try to understand the role that the use of, uh, of uh, fungicides in uh, agriculture plays in terms of developing resistance in clinical isolates. <clears throat> so um, <clears throat> once we had those uh, sequences, um, then we checked for their presence in our fungal isolates using polymerase chain reaction. So we designed uh, several primer sets in our lab to amplify a single 744 base pair amplicon um, that was part of the CYP51A gene. And, um, and the amplicon includes uh, the um, promoter region and, and all the common areas for the mutations um, and tandem repeats of the six most common mutations that we had uh, studied. And we just use a, a standard protocol with a 40 cycle um, uh, amplification of the uh, DNA and an annealing temperature of uh, 56 degrees Celsius. So um, let's get to some results. So we uh, identified 85 um, isolates, or we chose 85 isolates um, from three different countries in North America from which we isolate, obtained the, uh, the food crops and isolated uh, the fungi. So you can see in this chart, the tomatoes, barley, and wheat, um, and the number of isolates coming from, from each country. Um, so of the 85 isolates, um, approximately 31% were observed to be resistant to the 30, gram, 30 micrograms per mil of diphenylconazole. And um, we um, identified resistant isolates regardless of whether we, we streak them out on the plate um, containing diphenylconazole or whether we use the uh, microplate assay. And so um, in the picture, the pictures on the right, you're seeing um, the growing fungi. So um, uh, in picture A1 here and B1, but these are two different isolates grown on the potato dextrose agar without the, the phenylconazole and plates A2 and B2 are the same isolates grown on uh, the potato dextrose um, agar with the 30 micrograms of uh, the phenylconazole. So you can see A1, um, A1 and A2 are the two isolates, B1 and B2 are the same isolates. So you can see A, A1 in particular uh, had no problem growing um, in the presence of the azole compound. Um, whereas B1, um, there was a few resistant colonies, but, uh, but nothing um, as prominent as A2. So um, <clears throat> this shows our bioinformatic analysis, um, which is uh, assessment of the, uh, the gene mutations in the NCBI database. So you can see um, in the uh, row um, labeled mutation, or sorry, in the column labeled mutation, you can see the, the six most common mutations that we focused on the tandem repeats, either 34, 46, or 53 amino acids long, um, and then the amino acid substitutions, including the L98H, um, which is, is a very common one. And so um, in, in the clinical isolates, we saw the majority of, um, and I should say that the tandem repeats and this L98H um, mutation are, are linked, if you can remember that diagram that I, that I had showed uh, a few slides ago. So we can see that the majority of the clinical mutations um, tend to have this TR34 and um, L98H. If we look at environmental um, uh, isolates, um, we see that um, 
there are a, a number of them that have the TR34 uh, mutation and the L98H mutation. Um, but we see for this TR46, this is 46 amino acid substitution, we do see um, a much higher number in environmental isolates than in clinical isolates. Um, and then this is uh, represents papers that looked at both environmental and um, clinical isolates that were resistant. So it's, it, it appears that this TR46 um, could be used as a marker um, for environmental resistance as compared to, to clinical resistance. So um, what this slide shows here is the uh, PCR analysis, our PCR analysis of the uh, uh, CYP51A mutations. Um, so again, we amplified uh, the primers uh, that we designed were um, initially designed to amplify a 744 base pair region, uh, which includes the promoter region and all the, the, uh, the region of the, uh, the CYP51A gene that has the, that could contain the uh, mutations and tandem repeats. So the way this works is that, um, so here, um, if we look on the left side of the screen, this is, a, 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 and I should add that we um, we're looking for um, either the, the um, absence of a band um, or a band that had increased size above the 744 uh, at, uh, predicted size. So 744, somewhere around here. Um, and what I want to point out is that, um, and, and these are different isolates. Uh, the ones in the red box are uh, sensitive isolates that we included. And so if we saw, for example, an, in, uh, an increase um, in the molecular weight above 744 base pairs, that could mean that that was due to the presence of tandem repeats um, in the promoter region, which would lead to an increased uh, molecular weight. Um, if we saw um, you know, the absence of a band, um, you know, there are faint bands here, um, for example, um, which, um, you know, uh, could mean that um, the, the amplicon did not amplify. This might be a nonspecific band because of um, the presence of mutations. Um, these amino acid substitution uh, or uh, uh, substitutions in the codon leading to differential amino acids, which would cause the PCR reaction to fail because the primers would not be recognized by the DNA strands. So those are the two, the two uh, mechanisms we're looking for here. On the right side, um, this just shows uh, why we use cap uh, capillary electrophoresis. It's, it's, a, it's a great approach to see small changes in, um, in the molecular weight of, uh, of an amplicon that one could not see with conventional gel electrophoresis, for example. So this is showing isolate A12, M28, um, you know, so which, you know, looks to be, if you, and here you see the, uh, the size of the, or the molecular weight. So that looked to be around 744, but actually when we look at it, it's 787, as you can see by the peak over here. Um, so that would, that would seem to indicate that there's a tandem repeat there. So, um, you know, the, the original PCR that amplifies the, uh, the 744 base pair region worked well, uh, but we want to really try to drill down and see um, if we could really tease out the different uh, resistance mechanisms. So again, remember um, that the, the main one seems to be a tandem repeat. Um, in the promoter region, which could either be 34, 46, or 53 amino acids in, 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 in size, uh, coupled with um, a mutation downstream um, uh, leading to a transfer of leucine to histidine. And so we designed, uh, well, we, uh, up, we, we obtained primers um, which had been previously designed in the literature, in the scientific literature, and we use those to, to tease out these differences. 
So, um, so this is what you're seeing here. So at the top is the L98H um, PCR assay. Uh, where we're expecting a, a 143 base pair band. So this is what you're seeing here at this size. And um, um, if, um, if there was uh, a substitution um, in, the, uh, in the given uh, fungal respective isolate, um, then we would expect to see a, a failure here. Um, because the primers wouldn't wouldn't bind. So in lane seven, that's what you're seeing here. We do see increased um, banding here, uh, increased molecular weight um, banding. So that was is unclear why we're seeing that. Um, and we'll we'll get to that in, in more detail later. Um, and then here is a TR that stands for tandem repeat. So uh, in this case, the uh, the band. Um, is uh, is supposed to be 100 base pairs in length or in size, um, uh, the amplicon. And so we're seeing that here. So if there's a tandem repeat, we'd expect to see an increase in, in the molecular weight. So we're seeing that in, in, uh, in lane five um, and also in lane seven. So again, these could indicate the presence of tandem repeats in the promoter region. So, um, so you know, we we thought that we had evidence um, of of mutations in these assets. So we wanted to take a closer look at that. So um, what we did was we sequenced uh, three um, isolates. Uh, we actually sequenced four isolates, um, but I'm presenting the results of three uh, because one of them was actually uh, once we analyzed the sequences, we found that it was contaminated. It was a mixture of of, uh, of two fungal species. So we, um, so we sequence the genomes of, 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 of uh, three isolates. Um, so to do that, we isolate the DNA using the Kaigen uh, DNA power soil pro kit. And we um, subjected the uh, genomes to long read DNA sequencing using the Oxford Nanopore gridiron platform. Um, and you can see the, uh, the flow cells that we used. Um, and, and so this generated anywhere from 150 to 300,000 uh, reads, sequencing reads, um, with a median length of 20 KB. So <clears throat> following sequencing, um, we, we assembled the, uh, the sequence reads using a, a pipeline called FLY, uh, version 2.9.1. Um, and um, long read sequencing uh, can be prone to error correction. So we used a, a program called Medaca to correct for those er errors. And then um, we wanted to then extract um, two, two targets we, we focused on in the genomes, um, the CYP51A gene that we've talked about um, extensively here, and another gene, ERG11, which, which I'll talk about later. Excuse me. And then uh, once we've extracted those, we aligned the, the different sequences um, with a program called Muscle. So here we see um, the the uh, results of our sequencing. So we we picked an isolate from uh, tomato, one from wheat, and one from barley. Um, now the one thing, I, first thing I want to point out is if we go to the the, the far right column, you'll see that um, so we had. The, the goal here was to work with Aspergillus fumigatus. However, when we sequenced these fungal isolates, they did not turn out to be Aspergillus, but rather penicillium. Uh, and, and to be more precise, penicillium rubens. Um, so penicillium and Aspergillus are actually very closely related. And, uh, and, and so, um, and as we'll see, uh, the fact that, that these isolates are, are penicillium that did not really subtract from uh, from from our analysis. Um, what we're also seeing is uh, is some statistics here that really show the quality um, or can be used to determine the quality of the sequencing. So um, the overall size of the genomes range from 28.6 to 28.7 uh, um, gigabases, which is 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 good because they're all identified. Um, Using this, a program called Kraken2 as as the same, um, not only the same species but really the same isolate. 
um, the number of contigs uh, range from seven for the tomato isolate to 10 for barley, which again shows that the sequencing was high quality. Um, and, uh, and then we see um, other statistics that can be used like the end count and gaps, um, which are, are really um, uh, indications of missing data uh, and, and completeness. So there's no missing data here. So this again really shows that the, the sequencing was, uh, was very high quality. Um, and, uh, and the N50, uh, this, this column here really denotes the, um, the median contact length, which is an indicator of the completeness and overall quality of the assembly, um, which is about 4.5 gigabase for, for all of them. So again, overall, just a, a very good sequencing um, approach and, and good sequencing data, which gives us confidence that uh, when we extracted the various um, gene homologs, we, we could be confident in what we're seeing. So um, I just put this slide up here um, again to um, <clears throat> highlight the fact that, you know, we, we had aimed to isolate um, um, aspergillus uh, fumic acid, but we got penicillium rubens. This is a recent paper from 2021 um, that came out um, in which the authors report um, two new azole resistance mechanisms in, in the CYP51A gene um, in, in penicillium. Um, and they show that uh, one of the mutations could be transferred to azole sensitive aspergillus fumigatus isolates. Um, which subsequently, subsequently became um, azole resistant. So, so we see that um, these, these, again, these, these two species are closely related and, and, and uh, resistance mechanisms in, in the penicillium um, can cause resistance in the aspergillus. So um, even though we identified penicillium and not aspergillus, um, you know, interrogating their genomes for the resistance mechanisms can certainly be applied to, um, to aspergillus as well. So um, <clears throat> what this shows here um, are, um, this is a, a, a genomic tree um, and a, of, uh, of aspergillus um, uh, as well as 16 other different fungal species. So, as we've talked about point mutations um, in the uh, CYP51A gene um, is really a predominant mechanism of resistance to azole drugs in aspergillus. Um, so the CYP51 um, proteins belong to what is called the CYP superfamily and um, are conserved across different fungal genera. So this is, uh, what we've done here is assess the diversity of the CYP51A gene um, by constructing a, a phylogenetic tree of all protein sequences from fungi and the NCBI database. And what we did was we constructed the, the tree um, from multiple sequence alignments um, of amino acid sequences um, of approximately 1,100 gene sequences uh, from, from the fungi. Um, and so um, in the tree, sequences can uh, originate from the same genus, have the same color. Uh, and we can see that aspergillus in the gray um, here uh, formed most of the sequences in the NCBI database, um, which isn't really surprising because this, this is the, um, the genus that has been the most studied for azole resistance. Um, <clears throat> although, um, and, and, and then we see that uh, in different uh, genomes, though, um, the CYP51A gene is conserved across different fungal genera. So we see the different ones here, the different colors, and you can see um, we've labeled them here, but uh, you can also see what they are here. Um, and, um, and even though they come from different genera, they cluster together in the tree. Uh, and so um, since this tree was constructed based on point mutations, um, this could suggest a similar mutation or similar mutation patterns in the gene sequences from different fungal genera. So again, um, in terms of um, uh, our work, you know, with penicillium, 
um, you know, this um, shows that our analysis uh, would be is still useful in terms of trying to delineate these mutations that are related to to fungal resistance. Uh, Larry, I can jump in here. If we can uh, try to wrap things up quickly, we're getting a lot of questions and we'd like to make sure we have time for, for to answer those uh, questions. Yeah, so, okay. I, I only have, uh, I think it's two or three more slides. Um, so this is a, a phylogenetic tree um, that was constructed from the multiple sequence alignments of, uh, of amino acid sequences of um, six CYP51A sequences in the NC the I database. Um, this is uh, Spergillus. Um, what you're seeing in the pink with the star are our three isolates that we sequenced, uh, the penicillium rubens, and their CYP51A genes. Um, and we can see that they cluster nicely with the Aspergillus, although they do form a separate clade um, within the tree. So um, <clears throat> what this is showing is the alignment of, um, of our three isolates um, with uh, um, an, another isolate. Um, and, and this is where we did this alignment to try to identify known CYP51A mutations that have been associated with azole resistance. So what you're seeing are the alignments at the top. This is a, um, a, a, a um, sequence from NCBI that came from a resistant isolate of um, Aspergillus fumigatus. And then here, the, the, the remaining um, lines are or, or in the rows are, um, are isolates. Um, and so this is a partial sequence of, a partial sequence alignment of CYP51A gene. So what I wanna uh, uh, highlight is the mutations in red. We found a number of mutations in red, um, in, in, in um, particularly in this isolate, uh, BM32, which comes from barley. Um, and, uh, and you can see amino acid substitutions. These have been previously associated or reported, I should say, um, in azole resistant fungal isolates. So we are seeing um, some mutations in these isolates, these resistant isolates that have been previously reported. So the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, a gene called ERG11, um, which is uh, also mutations of which lead to azole resistance in candida albicans. So you might remember at the start of the talk, um, I, I said that aspergillus and candida are two main genera of concern with respect to azole resistance and, and the development of human infections. So we want to, to see, um, there are homologs of, of ERG11 in, in our penicillium isolate. So we want to see if we could identify any um, uh, resistance mutations in, in that gene. Um, and so uh, we did the alignments again. Here you see um, a Candida albicans, uh, or I mean a Candida auris isolate from NCBI and our, and our uh, three isolates and we aligned them. We looked for mutations um, associated with this gene in the penicillin, but we, didn't, we did not see any there. So to summarize, um, azole resistance continues to emerge, which we, we know is a threat to, uh, to human health. Um, and um, as I said, the start of the talk, the link between environmental fungicide use and clinical azole resistance, um, while likely, um, remains unproven definitively. Um, we did identify azole resistance in penicillium rubens based on known CYP51A mutations. Um, and uh, in future work, since we have the entire genome sequences, we'll be aimed at identifying novel azole resistance mechanisms in food and environmental fungal isolates uh, that have not previously been reported. Um, and, and this will include sequencing additional isolates from our collection. So with that, um, I'd like to um, acknowledge the funding for this project from FAO, as well as the, uh, the two people who did primary the majority of the work and the primary work on this, Dr. Opiyami Lawal, who is a postdoctoral fellow in my lab, as well as Jesse Huffman, who is a PhD candidate. Um, and with that, uh, I thank you for your time and uh, we'll take some questions.
All right. Uh, thanks, sir. If you could stop sharing your screen, that'd be helpful. We don't need to look at a, a question mark. Yeah. But, uh, and I'll share uh, mine. Um, a number of questions in the chat, and maybe I'll start with this first one, kind of uh, moderator's privilege a little bit too. Um, you talked about uh, the CYP51 gene. Do you know what that does in a normal, uh, what is its role in a normal fungi? And the question is, you know, mutations in that gene, does that add to any fitness cost to the fungi? And maybe even specifically from the chat, is there a relation between mitochondrial dysfunction? And obviously someone knows a little bit more about this than I do, and, and the mutations in that CYP51. Okay, so CYP51A um, is a gene coding for cytochrome P450 14 alpha sterile demethylase. <laughs> so it's very it's a it's a it's a complex uh, gene. Um, um, so it 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 it's really there um, to um, you know um, demethylate uh, compounds um, and. And so this is how it breaks down. Well, if 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 the if the um, if so, it will do that at a low level in azole in the azole compounds. Um, however, if you have these mutations, then what that leads to is is as I said, overexpression of the gene, which therefore increases its demethylase activity, and therefore leads to breakdown of the uh, of the azole compound. Um, and then, sorry, you had asked the second part. Well, the, is there a fitness cost for, or, or an advantage uh, to survival in the environment or potentially survival in the clinical uh, human host? Uh, well, um, if, you, if you remember the slide uh, that I showed uh, of the plate with the, the isolates where we, we showed, uh, we streaked them out in the presence and absence of the azole compound, and you could see one of them um, the, you know, grew just as well. So um, I get, it depends on the isolate. It depends on the 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 you know the type of mutation, like the tandem repeats in the promoter region, depending on you know how overexpressed that gene is. Uh, so I would say, depending on, on the isolate, you can see that there could be a fitness cost, um, or there 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 may not be. And and given the fact that um, these are the most common mutations that have been shown, and there are a number of clinical isolates that have them, um, I would say that. There really isn't a fitness uh, cost um, in the in the most uh, successful isolates, and of course, um, I think it, the the advantage, the obvious advantage of this is that it can survive in in the environment um, with these compounds. Uh, one thing I didn't say about azole compounds is they're because they've been widely used in the in the agriculture, um, the compounds are really everywhere in that environment. So not just the soil, but even the air. Um, and so these these uh, fungi have you know really have the ability to interact with the compounds and, and then become resistant. So so I think um, these mutations are a direct result of that, and and it does improve their ability to survive in in that given environment. Great, thank you. Another question is um, unlike bacteria. Well, I should say unlike bacteria. Uh, these uh, are mutations that you're talking about are not located on mobile genetic elements. And so the question is, you know, how important are they in terms of is it clonal expansion due to selective pressure? That's the main issue as it compared to transmission. Do you anticipate, you know, uh, a continued expansion? Or if we were to, to reduce the use of azoles in agriculture, do you think the prevalence of these uh, organisms would decrease in the environment over time? Yeah, so that's a great question. So the first part was, you know, unlike bacteria, they, they, these these mutations, um, at least the ones I presented, <clears throat> are not on mobile genetic elements, which is which is true. I would, uh, however, um, remind the audience that in bacteria, um, <clears throat> there are mutations, um, particularly in efflux pumps, that are not located on on uh, mobile genetic elements. And I did show briefly that. That is one mechanism, albeit not the main one that uh, that is um, is is present also in in these fungi. So, with respect to what we're seeing here, yeah, I think <clears throat> what we're seeing are clones 
um, from resistant ice, uh, you know, isolates that developed, um, and then they've just been disseminated. Um, you know, um, one thing that would be interesting to see, which we haven't looked at, uh, and we may try. It depends on, um, you know, what information we can glean from the scientific literature. But it'd be very interesting to see. Um, um, and, and I see there's a question here about what about information regarding farmers, and I was just about to discuss this. So it'd be very interesting to see if farmers t tend to have a higher, um, if, if the number of, of if, we, if the uh, uh, resistant fungal infections tend to be higher in farmers than in the general population, um, you know, because they're, they're there and potentially breathing in the spores, the fun fungal spores and so forth, which you know, we've, we've just said um, tend to become resistant in, in that environment because of their, in, their um, uh, interaction with the compound. So, um, but, but yes, I think what we're seeing are clones of, of these. So if we remove the azo compounds, I, I think that, you know, uh, we may not, I don't think we'd see necessarily a decrease. Uh, again, you know, it looks like these these isolates once they become resistant, there's not really a fitness trade-off. So, um, you know, it'd be interesting. It'd be interesting to see. But I, I think um, the goal what we, the goal of removing the compounds is not is to stop um, the emergence of new clones and new mechanisms. There in the scientific literature, there ha have been uh, some groups are now starting to look at the entire genomes, like we plan to, and and some groups have found. Um, in preliminary evidence, some new mechanisms um, for for resistance. So I think that's that's you know what we we would try to to do. All right. So uh, so you have uh, several different things talking about the problem for human health. One is the transmission problem from the potential from the environment and humans, and what is the attributable fraction that causes the resistant infections. And then the other one, and what is the impact of using azoles to, to the prevalence of these and magnitude in the environment? Uh, we'd like to stay on time here. We're one minute over. I need to close up. I think we appreciate your, your presentation, Larry. And when we attack uh, antimicrobial resistance, we need to go from farm to table. We need to go from the molecular to the global scale. And I think your presentation here really dove into some of the molecular sequence-based data and how that can inform the questions for uh, developing more practical on farm or agriculture or in clinic uh, uh, solutions that address this problem. And so uh, I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to remind the audience that there will be another webinar related to antimicrobial resistance on the same time. Uh, would be at 12.30 from our headquarters time in Rome on September 8th, and we look forward to having you join us again. Uh, the recording should be available uh, of this presentation future on our YouTube channel. Thank you very much for your, everyone for your time and your participation. Have a good day. Goodbye.